Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down with 2016 presenter Derek Hansen. Derek and I are going to sit down, guys. We're going to talk developing strength, power, and speed. Uh, and before we get going more, if you guys get a minute when you're done here, check out his website, strengthpowerspeed.com. There's a ton of awesome stuff there. Derek, he's he's a super guy and he's super smart and uh, has really been at the forefront of everything we do when it comes to performance training for for a while now. And it's uh, he's a guy that I think more people need to be visiting that site and and picking his brain and listening to him because he's his his wealth of knowledge is is really second to none. I'm really excited to have him on the docket this July. But all right, let's get back to the talk. So yeah, we're talking strength, power, and speed. And the first thing we're going to talk about is how track and field influenced where he's going and how he does things. Uh, Derek started out coaching and learning under the late Charlie Francis, so we get into talking about how big of a, an impact Charlie had on him and what the biggest impacts were and the lessons that uh, he still reflects on today. It wouldn't be a talk without talking about monitoring, I guess, in, in today's day and age, since it is really the sexy buzz thing that everyone likes to talk about. And... Derek really doesn't hold any punches when he talks about monitoring and measuring and, and what it is in his mind and the direction that he sees it pushing us as a, as a, you know, a profession in general. And it's, um, it's pretty neat stuff, you know, and coming from a guy who's, whose history and, and his experience started in track and field, you know, where everything is measurable, those sort of things are really cool to me to hear. Um, we talk about where coaches may have slightly misinterpreted uh, Charlie Francis's work and, those are some pretty cool things, and it comes back to another recurring theme of, you know, how important is strength or how strong is strong enough, and it's uh, it, it's funny how these things just keep repeating themselves. Um, you know, one thing he does touch upon that I thought was really super awesome is the best thing that you can do when it comes to making a plan is to be flexible with it, and that was something that he took from Charlie, and it's, uh, you know, we spend all this time and all this energy into coming up with these you know, periodized plans and step one and block one and block two and what this is and that is and the other thing is. But, you know, the thing that he said that, that Charlie was really the most, was, was really the most impressive thing to him is his ability to be like, okay, that's good, that's enough, or let's scrap it. You know, if we were going to go right, let's go left. Things like that to, to me are fascinating and, and learning how coaches distinguish those things, even if it's just their gut, I, I think is really awesome. And then we finish up talking about what to expect, you know, when you're in Richmond this July and hope you guys can all make it. You know, this if this is just a taste of what we're going to hear from Derek, it's really exciting, man. I, I love the talk. It's always great, you know, being able to sit and, and listen to this guy talk. He's absolutely brilliant. I hope you guys enjoy the talk as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Derek, thanks a bunch for being on with us today, man, and taking the time. Oh, awesome, Jay. I just, uh, I'm going to be uh, talking with you and I uh, met you a few times before, but we never had a chance to really sit down and rap. So this is, this will be good. Well, yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited. I'm even more excited to have you uh, down here in July. It's going to be, uh, going to be an awesome weekend. Really excited for it. Yeah. I, I've heard so much about it and just the experience that you've created down there. So just being involved uh, at any level is going to be good for me. Well, yeah, man, excited to have you. So let's let's get right to the nitty gritty here. So, obviously, you know your background being heavily influenced in athletics with track and field. How has that impacted you in your performance realm with uh, the strength and conditioning side of training? I mean, I think you know it's interesting. We're getting uh, more and more information about how in strength and performance training that we want quantifiable, uh, you know, data and results that we can kind of pour through and analyze and I think when you come from a track and field background at least myself everything was a measurable so you know you would go to the track and when you did a run everything was timed uh, the recoveries were timed very uh, closely and you know like okay I know I have this much time in my work to rest ratio and um, you know when you did something else like we do jumps or throwing something everything was measured and so every time you had a performance sort of performance feedback for yourself as an athlete or even as a coach watching your athletes um, and I always wanted to figure out 
okay, if I improved in this area, how much that would that improve my uh, my long jump or my my high jump or my hundred meters? So if I squatted more weight, what was the result? And a lot of the time, it was interesting. You're you're thinking that something might have a bigger contribution, uh, and it may not, or something that that you thought, well, this isn't that important, but it does. And I think that was the interesting thing about track and field is that I always got a result and now it was time to work back and figure out, well, what created that result? And it might have been something as simple as um, I got sick or I got injured and then took a week off, two weeks off, whatever it was, came back, personal best. So right there, what does that tell you? It tells you that, hey, maybe I was doing a little too much and I needed that rest, right? Um, so those types of things, you know, really interested me in terms of, you know, what I did back then and what I'm doing with, you know, non-track athletes is how can we, you know, affect a change. And everybody likes to think that, oh, we did this workout, uh, we won the national championship and that there's a direct result. And I'm, I'm the first guy to go, well, was it because of me? Um, you know, were there other factors and, and, and sometimes that can drive you a little nuts, but, um, you know, being analytical in that way, I think, is useful in terms of refining your, the way you do things, you know, the way you operate, the way you plan your workouts, the way you ultimately implement those workouts. So that's, that's been the interesting part for me. And I still would love to be able to work directly with a track athlete and, and just get into that mindset again of, okay, if we do this, you know, how does that change the outcome? Um, and I think we all do that a bit, but you know, I think you could, you know, if you can find a formula that works for you and you get the outcomes that you want and you can just manipulate the inputs, I think that's pretty exciting. Oh, no doubt about it. And it's, it's definitely more intriguing when it comes to a team sport because there's so many other facets. I mean, just the fact that it's five or 11 or however many people playing at the same time, let alone throwing in an implement and a target you know, to, to change things as opposed to it's just gun clock or, you know, rock throw, you know, it's like yes. how far, or how fast are you going? So to be able to, to monitor and, and to know that those things are having a direct correlation to improving performance is kind of what everybody's digging to try to find a little better outcome with. Yeah. And, and I guess you can't take yourself too seriously in that respect because, um, you know, if you're, you may have a great pro, we know it, you may have a fabulous program and everybody's hitting on all cylinders. And then as a team sport, you go out and they lose or they get upset or they have a really bad experience. And sometimes that's out of your control. A lot of the times that's out of your control. So, uh, how do you take that information and go back and make changes, if any, in your program? And that's, that's something I'm always, you know, struggling with is, you know, I thought the preparation was good. We didn't have the outcome that we wanted. How much of that was me? Um, and I think we, ha we, we have to have a lot of that self-reflection, um, you know, regardless if it was our fault or our contribution. So, Right. And then on top of that, all the other just cultural issues when you deal with multiple people as opposed to just one, whether it be motivation or togetherness and all of that, which can be pros and cons based on their physical preparation on top of that uh, yes. which makes all those things even even crazier I mean like we were just talking about with what's going on in the basketball tournament now I mean it's there's a lot of really really good teams that have lost and is it because they weren't ready or these other teams were more ready is it this whole parody thing that they like to talk about that's going on right now whatever that really means um, or is it just the fact that one team had a really, really good day and one team didn't, <laughs> and that's just it, you know, it's, that's why. Yeah. They Cause each ball. game is, yeah, it's a sample of one, right? So, uh, over, you know, and obviously this is why in the professional leagues they have three, four, you know, whatever, seven game series because they want to figure out what the average is. Right. Um, but yeah, one game you could, you, yeah, you could walk on that court and you're just, you're not feeling it. Right. So, you know, that's sport. Yeah. That's the crazy part about it. So getting into the track and field aspect, you worked and spent 
a ton of time with Charlie Francis. So let's talk a little bit about how Charlie's influence has impacted you as a coach. What have you taken from your time with him and and, and brought into the performance enhancement realm? I, I think the big thing with Charlie is that he was a very intelligent guy, and sometimes he would be talking about stuff uh, theoretically, and it would be you know you know flying over my head, and I, I didn't quite understand where he came up with that theory. But when it you know that was one aspect of Charlie. The other was when you watched him actually coach, and when he coached, everything was done in a very simple manner. Like he was very careful about the wording he used uh, when giving somebody instructions. Um, you know, didn't mess about. Uh, the other part of it was if he saw something that didn't look right or he felt that the athlete did something exceptional, he would be the first one to stop that workout and say, okay, we've accomplished as much as we need to accomplish today. And he was never, never, ever dogmatic about, well, well this is what we planned in the workout, so this is what we're going to do. And I think that's what I see uh, more often than not with coaches is, well, this is our plan. You know, we should be finishing all of this. We have two hours to practice. We're going to use every minute of that two hours, and we're going to do what was written. And if you said that to Charlie, he would say, how do we know? You know, how, who am I to say that that is the right amount of work to do on this day? Um, and, and that's a very unique person. You don't find many people with the security or confidence to say, you know, what I wrote on paper was a, my best guess, and it was wrong today. Um, and I think that's the biggest takeaway for me is, is he had an intuitive ability and confidence over the years that he developed to say, yeah, I, I got what I needed out of that workout, and let's cut it short, you know, by 30 minutes. There's no need to do any more work. If we do any more work, we could ruin what we've just accomplished. So I think that was the biggest takeaway in my in my opinion, um, you know, there's all these other theories that he had about you know sprinting from a short distance to a long distance and having a high day and a low day, which is all important stuff. But the biggest takeaway for me was how he took that that theory and implement on a daily basis with athletes. That's really neat, you know, and it's it's kind of like what people talk about now, you know, with that whole neat, cool optimal dose or minimal dose or I don't know I'm sure it'll be something by the time we put this out next week I'm sure there'll be another cool term to describe whatever that is but thinking of it almost like with how Louis would talk about you know the max effort method when you would set a new PR it's like that's it you're done you know and it's that because you've now done something the central nervous system has never been able to do before so why would you try to keep going? You've now instilled a new pattern or a new velocity or whatever it may be. Okay, cool. Shut it down. You know, it's as Star Trek said, you, you boldly went where no man had gone before. So, you know, let's let's map it and come back tomorrow and see what we got to build from then. And and I think you're right. Like that's something that it does take some some bravery to do, to to be like or, you know, if they stink that day, to be like, well, maybe instead of trying to hit these, you know, PRs and whatever it may be, maybe it is just going to be a tempo day and we're going to walk away and, you know, live to fight another one. Yeah, and and it's interesting because we have, you know, this real sort of push for technology and whether it's GPS or heart rate variability or you know, all these ways of measuring readiness and load. Um, and I think that's good. I think the problem we're facing right now is as a strength coach or a, a physical preparation coach, we, we know probably better than anyone else, you know, when we've reached that optimal load or when we're close to it. Um, but it's that communication to the, the coach, the head coach or whoever else is involved in saying, look, this is what I saw. Can we make an intervention that you're comfortable with? And I think that's the biggest thing right now is we haven't made that leap. Maybe like one team has or we have it in isolated areas uh, or pockets, but 
we're, I don't think we're anywhere near there yet in terms of, you know, getting everybody on board with this philosophy um, because everybody, you know, everybody wants to wake up at 5 a.m. and do more work in the morning and, and uh, oh, they train, you know, six days a week. We train seven days a week, you know, because we're better um, rather than going, hey, we can only tolerate so much stress uh, to create a positive adaptation. What is that amount? Let's figure it out. You know, what's the best time of day to do that? That that's where I you know that's where I hope we get. I don't know if we will. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, especially in a team setting. I think it's very hard, you know, and it, and it's because then what it gets into is it's now Johnny's great, Craig isn't, you know, and Jimmy's fried. So now trying to get the sport coach on, not just to understand that there's times, you know, break clutch. But now it's break clutch with this kid, break clutch with that kid, break clutch with another kid. Um, again, it takes bravery for a coach to, to step out away from their plan and say, well, then maybe they're just going to shoot. and Maybe they're going to do, you know, all sorts of crazy dive on the floor, rebound, smashing into pads type drills. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe this guy's just doing a walkthrough. And it's, and I think that it's hard too for some of the kids to understand that because you're going to get them at both ends of the spectrum too. You're going to get the ones that are going to say, well, why is he sitting out? I'm tired too. I should sit out. And then you're going to get, why do I have to sit out? I want to go do all the hard stuff because, you know, I was always the gym class hero, so I need to keep being, you know, the superstar, work, work, work. Um, So that cultural issue with it makes it very intriguing and and interesting and, and, and difficult. Because, you know, at the end of the day, when you're not doing things, the one thing a lot of, coaches worry about is well are these kids going to get soft yes you know and it's that's a whole nother topic but you know um but it's it's kind of interesting to hear that and and to see that that's really what what you thought was something that was completely novel and and very successful from him is his ability to just pull the plug or or hammer on the gas at the right time yeah, and you know, it's you know, sometimes you're going to have situations where maybe your guys just aren't good enough. Like maybe your players aren't making shots. Maybe your players just don't have the skill level. So, is hammering them into the ground going to make them better basketball players? No, you know, but everybody feels better about it because it looks like we're working hard when we're just really not working in the right area. Um, and that's that's the other part of it is. Um, maybe there is a huge education piece that we're missing as part of uh, dealing with the athletes and saying, okay, this is how we get better. Um, do you guys understand the approach? It's not just about hammering you guys. It's about you know finding out where your individual needs lie um, and how we approach you know improving you. So, and that's very advanced. You know, it, it you know it might, might not be ready for the college level, but it it's an advanced approach which I think. I hear about certain pro teams doing that, um, you know, but, but part of that too is personnel. Mm-hmm. You know, do you have the right personnel to move forward with that approach? And if you have crappy players and you have the best sports science and physical preparation team, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, you know, so coming to that realization is tough sometimes, but, um, you know, I, I, I just think educating the players finding coaches who are willing to be part of that education process and buy in is important too. And, and, uh, maybe it'll take a couple of generations before we get to that using the technology that we have and any new emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. Well, and even without the technologies, you know, you could do it as simply as just, you know, performance based and how we're doing and when we need to pull plugs on kids and, and those sorts of things. You know, and it's, it's funny when you bring up the whole idea of if, it doesn't matter if they're not good. I mean, it's, you know, back to, back to Val. I mean, it's, that's 
you know, his whole talk is it's the most important thing is skill. With no skill, there is no athlete. You know, it's like we could be able to, you know, you, you could be the greatest decathlete ever, but just because you're the best athlete in the world doesn't mean you're going to shoot 90% from the free throw line. You know, it's uh, it's a whole other skill. It's a whole other outcome, and it's it's pretty neat that that's, that's the same direction that it seems to be very common and simple, and it's... It's right, um, and that's that's great to hear. Yeah, and every I think you know I was having a conversation last night with a friend of mine, and you know we, we're we're talking to another fellow and saying, oh, um, if you're slow, you're slow. If you're fast, you're fast. Like a lot of this is genetically determined, and you know, but and and so the guy is saying, well, so what you're saying is I'm slow. I'm just destined to be slow. Yes, but everybody has some potential to improve. It's just your potential is not as great as somebody who's you know genetically better. And I think you know that that should be part of a discussion when evaluating players too. Is what you know what is the potential for this player to improve given his current you know performance level? And and sometimes and, and sometimes you have to do that and you have to make decisions about well is that person going to fit in as part of our you know team moving forward? And those are tough discussions, but. I think those are realistic discussions and finding out, okay, as a strength coach, what is the most we can get out of this guy? You know, is his vertical jump going to improve by, you know, four inches, you know, or, you know, is he, you know, and if he's doing, if he has a 40 inch vertical le- uh, leap, then 44 is re- pretty good. If he's got a 22, 26 isn't really where we need to be. So right. those are things you have to establish. I think when you're going through and identifying talent. Oh, no doubt about it. And it's, the whole individualization with that and, and selecting what and how is, is so important with those kids. And it's, it's something that, uh, that yeah, it, it's, it seems like it's so simple. And I think that strength coaches, for the most part, do a pretty good job with it in maybe a little too much of like a general sense with a lot of things where it would be something as simple as, well, this kid could probably put on six pounds. And if he benches X, he can probably bench X plus this. And, you know, looking at, like, kind of general strength parameters where kind of going all the way back to where your track and field side kicks in, instead of really trying to evaluate and find measurables that are going to at least correlate something to the actual performance, you know, and that's so hard with what we do because everything is so chaotic in sport, but, you know, is it something that maybe it should be more about your tens or some sort of agility test or is vertical the, you know, the end-all be-all test that a lot of people think or is there maybe more of a, you know, a long jump would be better? You know, you, you see different people say that when they see different things, there's different parts of the game that show up. But in the research, I don't think it's quite as validated as people like it to be. So I think that, you know, going all the way back to the beginning, that's probably the next step for us as coaches, you know. The monitoring and all that stuff I think is super important and I think that that needs to be a direction that it continues to move in uh, mm. just for wellness, you know, above and beyond everything. Um, and especially as these generations, and I don't know what the next one will be like, but like the generation coming into college now that has been so overly tested and just like ingrained over and over that all that matters is school and your grades. Now... I'm sure there's going to be some cats that show up to play basketball or football or hockey or soccer or whatever that couldn't care less about their social 101 class. You know, they couldn't care less about getting an education. But for the most part, like I'm lucky to work with a youth swim club. They just won nationals yesterday. Every single one of those kids will miss training dry land once every three weeks because of a test or because of 
a tutor or because of something for a college prep. And it's like, you guys are out of your minds. You know, like, I have to do this extracurricular stuff at school. Dude, you do extracurricular stuff. You swim at 4 o'clock in the morning. Like, are you, are you insane? Like, you swim at 4 a.m. and then you swim after school too. And then you go to this club? Like, their stress levels and how they handle these things, I mean, it's, their time management skills, these kids, it's, it's unbelievable. But this generation, how all this stuff has got them spinning, I would be really concerned that when you get to midterms at college and it's all like everybody's got everything due in a week or two, like, they're going to lose their minds. So how are you going to stress yeah. them in competition and, you know, practice, let alone bring them in a weight room and, you know, now we've got to hit, like, heavy squats or whatever it is, you know? Like, I think that it with this coming generation, it's going to be even more important. Yeah, you're right. Because, like you said, like, more, more, more is better. Overscheduled is better. And so, you know, how, how are they going to... Uh, look at training same sort of thing like I got to do more I got to you know I have to be I have to feel tired all the time otherwise I feel like I'm not working and, and we know that's not the best approach so yeah um, you know and, and, and it, it, the fascinating thing for me is injuries seem to be going through the roof now like the amount of injuries like even in I'm looking at NBA and I'm going how are these guys I've never did you ever hear of guys pulling hamstrings back in the 80s like you know, I don't think Magic Johnson or Larry Bird ever pulled a hamstring or Michael Jordan, but there's guys pulling hamstrings every week in the NBA. Why? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I'm trying to figure this out. Is, is Are they playing differently? You know? Yeah. I don't know. Groins, hip flexors. Yeah. You can see that. Hamstrings. When are you opening up in a, yeah. in a, in a 90-plus foot court? It's, you, know, you, don't, you don't have the ability. I don't know. But they also, the mileage those guys go through, like not just playing, like in the air, is yeah. unbelievable. And it's, I don't know who put, like somebody put an article out that it was like, like there's teams that almost are going to travel all the way around the world twice, <laughs> you know? And they, they maybe leave the country twice, you know? It's like, it's unbelievable yeah. to me. Like the, the mileage and travel and, and how those guys handle it. And that's, that's why they need to have like a whole team, you know, they, they've moved to that model. And, you know, obviously, you know, we both know art and, and those guys, you know, they, they need like those five or six guys there to be able to make sure that those guys, the, the investment is able to show up day in and day out. It's crazy to me. And I thought 30 games in college is a lot. 82. Yeah. Good yeah. grief. And, yeah, and they play in the summer. Yeah, yeah, definitely, right? So I was looking at uh, the amount of off-season time that different professional sports have, and it's, it's shrinking, right? The amount of time and, that they actually spend on general training is shrinking or disappearing altogether. So maybe that, that's it, right? Maybe that's the problem. Oh, 100%. Yeah, it's... When you're that big and you're running on that hard of a surface for that long, it's got to, I mean, you know, something's going to wear out. And it's, it's crazy, man. It really is. The games are great right now, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is astonishing to me. Like, like the games are great, but it's like, I don't, I don't know how those guys do it. It's so much just extraneous stuff, you know, with, with the travel and, and everything else that they have to deal with on top of playing 82 games, you know, and it's, again, I think that's where the monitoring stuff is really important. You know, when is it a day to maybe not play a guy so you can save your $10 million a year investment? That's, it's crazy to think about, you know, just how a little miscalculation could cost you that much money. Yeah. Yeah, and then obviously you have to have um, people's perceptions and views change because when you sit a guy, are people going to be up in arms like, "Hey, I paid to see that guy play. How come he's not playing?" Yeah, you know. Yeah, like what happened to Popovich a couple years back. Yeah, but at the same time, too, if you don't understand 
that aspect of it. And I do understand what those people would be complaining about. Because it's, it's kind of not fair. But if they really understood what was going on, they should understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, so then coming back a little bit, back to some things with Charlie. He's a guy that a lot of people like to talk about and a lot of people like to cite. What are some of the things that you see people do that might be mildly misinterpreted from how he used to do things? Um, well, the one thing that you'll, you'll hear about is, um, you know, they'll talk about the weightlifting um, sort of feats of strength that Ben Johnson had and, oh, he squatted this much and he benched this much. And, and I think he you know, that's created a lot of problems in terms of what the contribution of weightlifting is to speed development. And I think the problem is, is the weightlifting was more of a result of his performance levels achieved on the track rather than uh, a determinant. And so if he's, you know, if he parallel squatted 600 pounds, um, is that going to make you faster? Absolutely not. You know, he had that specific ability and Charlie knew how to use that in a way that didn't, you know, negatively impact his sprinting. And part of that was they had a lot of physical therapy and massage and things going all the time before workout, after workout, in the evening um, to help make sure that that wasn't a problem in terms of muscle tension and and wear and tear. Um, So that was a very unique situation. Um, but if you, if people think that, you know, gains in the weight room are going to lead to, you know, faster times on the track or in a 40 yard dash, you have to be very careful. Um, you know, there, there's a point of diminishing returns in any training element and your job is to figure out what that is, um, and not, not get caught up in, um, you know, Hey, you know, we had a great day in the weight room and we're doing, we're lifting all this great weight. Well, what is your sport? Like, if you're a weightlifter, that's awesome. But if you're not a weightlifter, um, that could have serious repercussions for other things. It could, you know, fatigue you for something that you should be really focusing on. It could take away central nervous system energy. Um, and you don't want to be robbing yourself of that. Or it could set you up for an injury, you know, in basketball practice. If you work too hard, you know, on quads or low back or something, that, that could set you up. And I think we have to look at everything in a context and again, it goes back to what are our inputs, what outputs do we want, and and that was the, that was one of the big things you always hear. It's like, oh, Ben Johnson did this, you know, we should train like this, and it's like, no, 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 you're missing the point. Um, and other things that Charlie did would be like, um, you know, we train speed, power, and strength on one day, and then we do tempo on another day. So it's an alternating central nervous system, high intensity, uh, low intensity, um, sort of you know, approach to training, which, which works. Uh, I think where you get into trouble though, is that people don't understand that it's all determined by volume. So you could probably do something high intensity every day. If you shrink the volume down, like we're talking about like this, uh, optimal load, like maybe if you wanted to do something high intensity every day, you shrink the volume down. And so the impact on the nervous system and the peripheral system is not as great. Um, but you know, the accumulation of that work kind of, you know, vaults you up. So that's a different approach. And that's something that we had talked about. He said early in the season, uh, in a general prep phase, he would do that. He would do smaller doses of high intensity, which weren't really high intensity because, you know, it's early in the season. We're not hitting those levels of output. So we can layer those things and use it to our advantage. So, you know, the thing with Charlie is he had these ideas, um, which at face value you have to be very careful if you adopt it that way and just go carte blanche and go straight you know straight away with that when he was constantly adjusting things and for the sake of his materials and his presentations we would try to make things very you know simple and black and white mm-hmm. but under, understanding those materials and then going and working with your athletes and doing this sort of iterative approach of okay how did they respond how do we adjust the volume i mean that was the genius of charlie you know, the concepts are important, 
but knowing how to implement them, I, I think was, was maybe something that, you know, we could have, you know, when he was around, we could have conveyed a bit better. And uh, I think he found it difficult to convey that because everything was situational for him. Everything was like, well, let's see what happens on the day and that'll make my decisions or help me make my decisions for the next day. And when you're teaching a seminar, it's really hard to convey that. Yeah. You know, well, looking at it, it's not just an N of one with the athlete, but it would be the N of one is in the athlete that day. Yes. And that's, that's a totally different thought process, I think, than what a lot of people have. It's because they would just say, no, the N of one is Derek. It's not the N of one is Derek at 1245, you know, Eastern Daylight Time on a Sunday. On this yes. Sunday, it would be, no, they, most people would say, no, that's just Derek. That's pretty neat to, to be able to take a step back and, and do that. That's, that's pretty eye-opening. You know, to, to to look at everything, even from a higher point, but with a more laser focused position. You know, that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and and the I mean, the funny thing was that a lot of the stuff that we did was after the fact. So he would go to the track and make decisions on things he would see the previous day. If he stretched somebody out or worked on them, like massaged them, he would get information that would determine what he would do that day. So you can't plan for that. You can't. So we would write plans, and then we go to the track, and it would come out. We'd we'd be lucky if we did fifty percent of what was written, and 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 that is very difficult for some people to 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 wrap their brain around. Is that, you know, every like you said, everything's determined by that 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 particular time of day with that athlete, the communication that they've had, uh, the nonverbal communication, and what the stopwatch is telling Charlie after the first the initial reps. Um, because people will start saying, well, why am I reading this book on periodization? Why am I taking this course on program planning? And that's all important. You should do that. But don't be afraid to break away from whatever you've planned because, as you said, it's a, it's a fluid. Everybody's fluid in terms of their, their readiness, state of readiness or state of you know, basic you know, performance. So if, as soon as you understand that, it makes it easier to make that leap to go, okay, well, let's change it for this day. But for some reason, you know, the way things are taught, you know, science is science. It's hard, hard science, and this is the approach we're going to take, and let's just go and put our head down and let's do it. Where science, you know, Charlie Francis' brand of sports science is, is anticipatory, reactive, all these things mixed, spontaneous, mixed into one based on what he sees on at, at any given moment. And that's, that's, I mean, is, I don't know if you want to call it the art of coaching, but it's, it's a weird brand of science that nobody's really mastered at this point. No. And it's, I, I do, I think probably calling it the art of coaching is, it's probably as close as we're going to get to being able to label it, to be honest. But it's, uh, it's really, really neat like it's, it's got me thinking right now like Monday like how can we take a step back and, and do this now it's obviously harder when you have three athletes at a time let alone when you have a group of like 20 um, yes but I still think that you could probably find a way to get a feel at least for the pulse of the group to understand whether it's you know time to lay the hammer down or time to pump the brakes, that's that's pretty awesome. That's yeah, and and I think you know again that's a lot of that is going to be experiential and your ability to kind of take in you know what you've seen over the years as a coach and go okay well you know this I did this with this athlete and this happened and I did it with that athlete. And you just kind of, you know, synthesize it in your brain and go, okay, there are distinct patterns that I see that can help me with my day-to-day -day conduct and operations and how I, I make decisions. And I think that's I think that's what we should be teaching people. We shouldn't be teaching people like that A equals B or you know it, it, it's like a non-linear approach, um, which again takes time and it's not about going and just just writing your CSCS exam or uh, going to a weekend uh, seminar or conference, 
and I have always said this before, is like when I go to your conference, I'm not going to go, well, I have a brand new way of looking at the world or I'm going to do this, you know, exercise that I saw here. That That's an opportunity for me to reflect back on how do I improve myself and learn more about some of the things that was were presented at your conference and how do I connect with those people and get into their brains and find out experientially what they have found, you know, what they've discovered and I mean that's I think that's the learning process there. It's your your conference is the starting point for new experiences. Oh, so. totally. Totally. And selfishly that's exactly why I started <laughs> doing it. Um so that you can have experiences just like this one, let alone, you know, when you're sitting there, you know, in a room where we'll be sitting down with you and Hank and Buddy and me and a piece of paper, you know, and it's just listening and, and figuring things out and then coming back later and looking at what you do and then thinking about what was talked about and how you guys were discussing things and where it fits or doesn't and how can it help your wheel spin a little faster, you know. It's, it's probably not going to make it any rounder, but, you know, can you make it spin a little quicker? And that's, that's just what we're all trying to do. And that's... Um, it's pretty awesome. It's a lot of fun, you know, to be in the middle of it. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun uh, <laughs> to be in the middle of it. Because um, it does, it, it brings in some pretty interesting, different mindsets that, you know, that'll make you, that'll make you question quite a bit. And it's, that's what's yeah. fun to me. Yeah, and I think the interesting part is, like, what are the commonalities? Like, you'll have, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting in a room, and everybody's going to have some common experience and commonalities in their approach. Uh, and that's good. But sometimes we're all making the same mistakes, too. And we have to have, you know, the capability to go, well, maybe we're all wrong over here, but we're doing everything right here. And then, then you're going to have the outliers who may be right, but not everybody has kind of shifted that way yet. So it's, that's the interesting part for me is like, oh, that guy had this experience over here. It, was that just a one-off, or is that something that we should be moving towards? Um, whereas, like, even the concept of warm-up um, is interesting. Like, if you watch people warm up, a lot of the time it's really lackadaisical. It's just sort of this routine that people adopt, and they just go back and forth and back and forth. And there's not the intensity and the activation that's, that's needed, right? Everybody's, you know, oh, we're going to do our dynamic warm-up when they're just sloshing back and forth doing you know stuff because they were told to do this exercise and i find myself in that trap sometimes too and having this ability to build on each exercise and the intensity and get them ready you know so when they have to you know go in practice or in games they're there there's not this gap and i think you know that's what i'm trying to explore with warm up now is can i simplify things and not worry about individual exercise so much, but think about more general concepts like neural activation, central nervous system activation at the right volume, at the right amount, so that I don't fatigue them too much, but they're ready to go. And how do you do that? Um, and, and not get people into this pattern of just habituation. And, um, you know, because if, if we don't challenge people, they're not going to get better. So if you're doing the same warm up all the time and you, you there is no build up of intensity and there's no there's no changes through the the, the stages of the warm up are you actually bringing them down you know these are things I'm thinking about right you know are you just you know are are they just settling um and that's what I see sometimes you know you know we have this grand warm up with all these exercises that look really good but are they actually warming up yeah you know Oh, huh. no, that's a, that's, that's an interesting thought. And you would almost think though, to be devil's advocate, that maybe the routine is what allows them to get mentally ready to do what Possibly. they're going to do, you know, Possibly. but if they're just, you know, lollygagging their way through, you know, like the walking dead, is it worth that sacrifice for them to think they're ready. That's hmm. yeah. Cause I always think of like, I always go back to like the animal models 
And like, you know, you're walking your dog, your dog sees a, you know, a rabbit run across the field and he's like, boom, right? <laughs> you know, how did he do that? You know, like he didn't do his, he didn't do his dynamic warm up before that, right? But maybe your dog is wired that way and, you know, maybe it's okay. I don't know. Like, I, you know, there's obviously different processes going on in a dog's brain versus ours, but how, how was that possible? And did we devolve, you know, into, you know, taking it slower and, you know, rather than, you know, chasing after that rabbit, we're like, oh, I'm going to go plant, uh, you know, some corn, right? That's a little easier on me, right? Um, so, th I mean, I, those are the crazy things that go through my head when I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of different ways of approaching uh, athlete preparation and, you know, are we being too soft in one area or too hard in another area? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's that's the billion dollar question that we're all trying to figure out at all times, and it's uh, I, I love the dog example. <laughs> you know, so you hear it all too often. Does a dog ever stretch before it chases a car, or, or the other one you hear is like, does a does a deer stretch when it hears your shotgun go off? You know, or does it just go? Yeah, now, I wouldn't stretch either. I'd probably just run. But I mean, you know, <laughs> it's. Uh, I think I think a gunshot's a little bit of an extreme example. The rabbit makes a lot more sense. But well, yeah, one of the, one of my friends, he worked with uh, soccer in Europe, and he was talking to a player, and and uh, his comment was, "Burglars don't pull hamstrings," <laughs> and because you know, because they're running for their whatever their life or their freedom, right? <laughs> you know, because it, at that, and again, that's a very high level of activation, and. If we've habituated to lower levels of activation, I think that's when injuries occur because we don't have complete recruitment or complete buy-in with all the muscles and you know in the body and the brain's not sending that single signal strong enough. But yeah, if somebody you know if you're walking down the street and somebody starts coming after you with a knife, I don't think you'll pull a hamstring. You'll just do what you have to do, right? Yeah. So, but that you know I don't know how you bring that concept into training. You're not chasing athletes around with knives, but. Um, Maybe there's something we can learn from that. Yes. So everyone listening, we do not condone chasing the <laughs> athletes around with, with any sort of weapon with whatsoever. <laughs> but Derek, hey man, I really do appreciate you spending the time with us this morning, and uh, this is an awesome talk, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure we'll continue on uh, when I meet you in July, and and just. And unfortunately, a lot of those talks take place outside of the uh, the conference room. Or, but um, it's it's I mean that's the reason we get together. Oh, no doubt about it. And it'll be a, it'll be an absolute blast, man. Thanks again, and uh, we'll be in touch real soon. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. This is great. Brilliant. Thank you. And a huge thanks to 2016 presenter Derek Hansen for taking some time out to talk with us. I mean, guys, just absolutely amazing stuff. You know, looking at. Like I said in the early part, just the ability to be flexible with your plan, knowing that all the things that you know they do in track are measurable. So the monitoring idea to them is, is something that's as old as running in and of itself and how we can utilize that information to, to better ourselves. I mean, just priceless stuff. I mean, you know, there's a billion more gems over on his website. Again, check it out, strengthpowerspeed.com. You know, if, as soon as you're done here, hop over. And I hope you guys enjoyed the talk, and I hope you're as excited for July after hearing this as I am. Derek is an absolute wealth of knowledge, and I am absolutely ec ecstatic to have him in Richmond July 15th and 16th for the seminar. We hope you guys will be able to make it out to Richmond, Virginia for the 2016 edition. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed the talk, please share it to the social media outlet of your choice. Any questions, thoughts, comments, leave them below. We'll get Derek back on here again before the seminar, guys. And as always, thank you for listening to the podcast and being involved in Central Virginia Sport Performance. We'll see you back here next week with another awesome guest.